Wow. I'm Mitchell from Australia, and this is the number one flat earth proof. The premise to this starts with the sextant and how we use the sextant in celestial navigation. We look directly through the sextant at the horizon. But if you live on a globe, what horizon are you actually looking at, Globers? Is it the Earth horizon? The water horizon? The horizontal reference plane? The visible horizon? How about the sensible horizon? The geodial horizon? Or the celestial horizon? Well, it's certainly not the geometric horizon. You know, Earth curve? No, that was debunked by the black swan over 18 months ago. But now the globe-believing zealots tell us that their horizon is refracted. It's not an actual horizon. So how do we have a tangent to a refracted horizon? When you're viewing a star on a globe, how are we measuring an angle to the horizon if it's refracted? You will never ever get an angle to a refracted horizon. This is a major problem if you think you live on a globe because celestial navigation would be impossible. So what have you done to keep your religion of a sphere Earth semi-plausible? You've presupposed that that line 90 degrees above your head, the zenith, actually runs to the centre of your presupposed spherical Earth. And 90 degrees from that, you've made up a new horizon, the celestial horizon, which you say is a horizontal plane passing through the Earth's center perpendicular to the zenith. So, after presupposing all these things, you can now use your sextant. But globe believers, realizing that their visual horizon is refracted, can't yet look at the horizon through the sextant. So yet another horizon is needed to be fabricated. They use the bubble level in the sextant to create the artificial horizon, which we are then told is parallel to the celestial horizon, essentially taking away the curvature of the Earth. Because even globe believers know you cannot measure an angle to a curved surface you think's beneath your feet. Look at this. You're pretending you're living on a globe, but in order to measure angles, you need to pretend you're living on a flat plane. This is cognitive dissidence, Globers. You can't have it both ways. So now they can actually start and take a measurement from their zero point of the artificial horizon to the celestial body. Look at what the globe believers are doing. They must treat what they see as flat in order to achieve an angle. But there's one more step, and this is where it all falls apart for the globe. They then have to measure from the artificial horizon a dip angle down to the visual horizon. The only actual horizon that we have. Remember that horizon that you said was Earth curve that is now refracted? Do you all realise now how devastating the black swan actually is to the globe? It has taken away your R value, the radius of your globe. And then it took away the curvature of the Earth altogether when it forced you to say that the horizon was refracted. And together with the sextant, it's now taken away your ability to navigate. Since January 1, 2020, the globe has been dead. So now it's time to prove where we actually live. May I present to you the number one flat earth proof. Here in reality, we live on a flat plane. And this may be news to people, we also have a flat sky plane above us where the celestial bodies exist. From the vantage point of our flat plane, when viewing the celestial bodies, we perceive their position and movement as a dome. This is purely our perception from this vantage point on our flat plane. It's not actually a dome above the earth. All celestial bodies rise in the east, move in an apparent semicircular motion above the sky, and set in the west. Now don't get me wrong, our Earth is measurably, observably, and obviously contained. But it just doesn't have to be a dome shape, or any shape for that matter. But I digress. Looking at this 
flat celestial plane above our heads, we can see that everything rises in the east, moves across the sky, and sets in the west. We just perceive a motion of a dome shape. So let me give you a real world example of how this works. This is Lake Woolambula, quite fittingly the breeding ground to black swans, and, I kid you not, located on Black Swan Way. Now, relative to the horizon, if you look up, straight up above your head, 90 degrees, to where my drone is sitting, right there, 90 degrees, what will happen when that drone moves straight ahead in its own flat plane? It's not going to change altitude. It's just going to move straight ahead. From my observer point, what's going to happen? The angle is going to change. The drone has not changed altitude at all. It's just changed the distance from where I'm observing it. If it moves again, the angle changes again, down to 25 degrees there. As it continues to move away, or if I move away from it, it will travel towards the horizon, lowering in its angle, and eventually it will get so far away that the angle will be too small for me to see, and it will appear as if the drone has set. This is all relative to the observer point. This is all apparent. It's not actually lowering. It's just getting too far away and the angle is decreasing. This creates that dome motion and movement that we see in the flat plane of the celestial bodies. Now that we understand that the flat celestial plane above us presents itself as a dome to our perspective point down here on the plane that we exist, we can understand how the celestial navigation actually works. Every star in the flat celestial plane has a position relative to our flat plane where it will be 90 degrees. This is called the geographical position or the GP of that star relative to our flat plane here on Earth. When the observer is at the GP of the star, it appears 90 degrees above their head. Celestial navigation works by using a sextant to measure the angle of that known star and using its relative GP, ge geographical position, to know where you are. And I'll continue to point out that measuring angles to celestial bodies only works if we are on a flat plane. Now, if one observer measures 30 degrees to a star, and another observer measures 30 degrees to that same star, we can conclude that they are both on what's called a circle of equal altitude. And this is another killer blow to the globe right here. Everything on that circle of equal altitude is exactly that, equal altitude. No matter where you are on that circle, you're going to measure 30 degrees. And through being able to measure an angle to that star relative to the horizon, everything on that circle, in between that circle, in the area of that circle, is absolutely flat and level. By doing this once with a sextant, you know you are somewhere on that circle of equal altitude. To triangulate your actual position, you need to repeat these steps. With other stars, your position is where all these areas of equal altitude meet. This is how celestial navigation works and has always worked on our flat level plane using the celestial flat level plane. Let's use this small scale example on Lake Woolambula. Instead of a drone, we're going to use a star. So if observer A measures an angle, to the star, and observer B measures an angle to the star, the same star, both angles are the same, 30 degrees. Knowing the GP of that star, they can conclude that they are on the same circle of equal altitude. 
distance between observer A and B and the area inside that circle is all in the circle of equal altitude. It is all flat. It is all the same level. This is the killer blow to the globe. Not only is our world observably and obviously flat, it is measurably flat, as I'm about to show you in this next large scale example. The rule of thumb with celestial navigation is to use stars over 15 degrees in elevation because under 15 degrees, we start getting a lot of refraction, as you can see in these moon images. And this is real refraction, where something moves relative to the horizon, not the actual horizon itself being refracted, as anti-flat earthers would like to tell us after seeing the black swan images. So, if an observer was looking at Polaris from 15 degrees latitude, negative 60 degrees longitude, here near Dominica, they would measure 15 degrees to Polaris. And if another observer was on 15 degrees north latitude and 120 degrees longitude, they would also observe an angle to Polaris of 15 degrees because we know the distance between these two points are absolutely flat on the same circle of altitude. We can measure between them and we get 10,375 miles of flat earth and ocean. And that's being nice to the globe. We can definitely see Polaris on the equator and even sometimes below the equator, which is a much larger distance of flat area, earth and sea. Let's do this north to south now. If someone was at negative 75 latitude, looking at a star with a GP on the equator, we would be on the same area of equal altitude as someone looking at the same star from 75 degrees latitude. Knowing that between these two points has to be absolutely flat, let's measure between them 10,375 miles again with an area of 84.5 million miles absolutely measurably flat. But it doesn't stop there. Look at this map with all the GPs of the navigational stars on them. And the reason why this is the number one flat earth proof is because using just one area of equal altitude proves that that large area that we're navigating on is absolutely flat. But by doing this multiple times, to create multiple areas of equal altitude, we can literally measure our entire world as flat. Just so you understand the enormity of this proof, we can literally measure our entire world as flat. We are living on a flat earth. 2020 was the year of the black swan. 2021 is the year of the sextant. There is no more debate. The globe has been killed. The flat earth has been proven. This is the number one flat earth proof. Wow.